Can we establish? <clears throat> oh, and you know what I don't have in front of me, Nate? I got your agenda and I've got your five year goals. I don't have the preamble. Oh, yeah. Um, let me see if I can find it. I don't have it readily available either. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, look, here it is from February 16th. I, I, hearing. That's the, so the first paragraph. We're not having a public hearing today, right? No, um, today. So it's just that first paragraph, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And do we have any audience members at this point? Uh, we have Hilda. And that's it. Okay. I mean, yeah. okay. Okay. So it's 634. Uh, I'm Robin Fordham, chair of the HIP Amherst Historical Commission. And I'm opening this meeting of the Historical Commission on July 10th, I believe it is. Um, and pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020, order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. General Law C30A Section 18 and pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2022, by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022 and extended again by the state legislature on July 14th, 2022 and signed into law on July 16th, 2022. This public, here, uh, this public meeting of the Town of Amherst Historical Commission is being conducted by a remote participation. Members of the public who wish to access this meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time by technological means. A hyperlink to the hearing is posted on the town's online calendar. So that takes care of that part, right? It does. I just have to get back to our agenda. Of course, I've lost. <laughs> so, first item on our agenda is announcements. Um, I just sent to members of the commission. Um, an announcement for, and I believe it was a, I can't remember the date, an August meeting of the uh, Western Mass Historical Commission Coalition, which is specifically directed towards issues of the um, Community Preservation Act. So that's a Zoom meeting, and I would encourage anybody on our commission to attend if they can to um, learn about how the CPA Act works and how it relates to the work of our commission. Uh, other than that, I don't have any announcements to you, Nate. Uh, no, not right now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so moving on to item number two, we welcome our new members, uh, Michaela Raznick and Antonia Brillenborg who are joining our commission for the first time today. We are so delighted to have them. And I'm just gonna give them the opportunity to introduce themselves. Um, Michaela, if you wanna go first and just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your interest in the commission. Yeah, of course. Hi, I'm Michaela. I uh, moved to Amherst uh, just one year ago. I work at Amherst College as the ADC of the Russian department. Um, and I have a bachelor's degree in history from um, Humboldt State University in California. Great, welcome. Thank you. And Antonia? Hi, I'm Antonia. Um, I'm a rising junior at Amherst College and I am became very interested in seeing what the serving in the Amherst um, Commission, specifically the historical committee due to our, the rich history of the town um, would be like. So I'm really honored to be here. Okay, thank you. Thank you for, for joining. Okay. Um, agenda item number three is the designation of commission representatives to design review board 
Oh, quickly, yeah. Robin. Sorry, could we just go around and maybe just do? We could do roll call and then have members and myself oh, sure. you could introduce each other. Oh, okay. All right. Um, so uh, roll call. Um, so I guess I'm just going to call your name, and if you're here, say I. <laughs> Um, um, so Robin Fordham, I'm the chair of the commission. I, uh, Pat Off. Present. Okay. Uh, Madeline Helmer. Okay. I think you said present there. Uh, and uh, Michaela Rasnick. Hi. Okay. And Antonia Brillenberg. Present. And Hetty Startup is not present for this meeting. And that's all of us, right? I'm not forgetting anyone. Okay, and um, I'll start by introducing myself. I'm Robin Fordham. I've been chair of the commission since I believe January of this year. Uh, I started serving on the commission in I think the fall of 20, spring or fall of 2018. Uh, I recently got my historic preservation degree from the University of Vermont, master's degree in December of 2022. And um, I am, I have worked uh, recently with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, and right now I'm looking for another job in the preservation field. Pat? Um, I have a great interest in architecture and historical buildings and communities, and I have kind of studied that as I've traveled the world, but I love living in Amherst and I want wanted to be on this commission because I really want the character of Amherst to be protected even as we move to the future. Um, I'm a licensed psychotherapist and an educational um, person and um, I'm happy to, to join you tonight. Thank you. Madeline? Yeah, can you hear me now? Is that better? I can hear you now, yeah. Okay. Um, my name's Madeline. I work as an architectural historian and urban planner at a local um, consulting firm here in Amherst. Um, so I have uh, more than 10 years of experience in historic preservation and historic preservation planning. So um, I moved to Amherst like two years ago, and um, this is my way of really getting to know um, the town better and um yeah being able to to participate in in historic preservation where i live great thank you uh nate did you want to give us a little bit of your background sure I'm, I'm nate i'm a planner with the town a staff planner i help with the commission a number of boards and committees uh you know planning board housing and some others the um for new members, I guess we haven't reached out yet, but we can do a, an in person orientation or over zoom if you'd like uh, in the next month with Robin and myself. Um, and then just some housekeeping, you should have received a, a packet in the mail from the town clerk with open meeting law guide you have to do an online uh, test and then be sworn in in person. I, I think it has to be in person, at least. Um, so if you haven't you can email me afterward and we can. I know someone last week and another border committee hadn't received their packet yet and they're um, appointed at the same time. So it could just be delay in mail. So yeah, I've been working with the town for over 10 years. I have a, two degrees in landscape architecture and urban planning from UMass. And uh, I live in the area. And you can see I, I uh, have a really old photograph of town hall as my background. <laughs> and uh, Michaela, did you wanna add anything? Nope. How about you, Antonia? Anything you forgot? <laughs> I think that's good for now. Okay, good. Okay. So designation of commission representatives to design review board and community preservation act commission. Um, I currently serve as the designee to the community preservation act commission. I'm willing to continue that um service unless well i mean i would say yeah i'm willing to continue i don't feel the need for anybody to take over at this point um but we haven't really talked about a representative to design review board so i'm curious if uh either our new members or pat or madeline would be interested in taking that on and maybe nate wants to speak a little bit to the responsibilities there sure yeah the design review board there's um, a design review district it encompasses most of downtown 
and areas within 100 feet of the town common in any town project. Uh, there's a design review board. It's made up of representatives from other boards. Uh, and I think it could be up to five members, three, three representatives and two at-large members. And uh, you provide design advice for projects anywhere from, you know, it can be signs to, you know, restaurants opening, uh, even to larger projects, new buildings. You can look at everything from their massing to their streetscape. And so the historical commission has a representative that would be voted on by the commission and then you could sit for a year and then it could change or you could remain and it's been vacant for a little bit and so we don't have to decide tonight i just wanted to you know rob and i wanted to put it on the agenda just to talk about it and then we could consider it um you know at the next meeting the drb meets as needed so sometimes they might not meet for a few months you know it could be busy depending on how many projects are under their review but i'd say in the last few months they've only met twice uh, and their meetings are pretty quick uh, and they've been pretty straightforward. Nate, do they meet on Zoom? They do. Uh, yeah, they meet on Zoom. I mean, I think that's something all boards and committees might be talking about later, you know, in the fall, what, what happens in terms of meeting. But the, all the packets are online. If you go to the boards and committees webpage for the town and then look under design review board, uh, their packets should be uploaded uh, I could I could double check in a little bit, but um, yeah, and so they provide recommendations to either other boards or to the town staff to the building commissioner. So if a, you know the planning board is reviewing something for a land use permit, it might also go to the design review board, and then they provide recommendations or a summary memo to the planning board in terms of advice for that project. We've been trying to tell, you know, we've been trying we're trying to tell people, like especially restaurants downtown, are typically subject to it. We tell them. Uh, consider this free design advice, right? You can go spend a half an hour, people will comment on your, your signs, your graphics, and, you know, and you can ha have some, you know, a good discussion. And so we've been trying to frame it that way. And for anybody on the commission who might be interested, but feels like um, they don't quite know enough. I mean, I started on the CPA committee, not really knowing anything about CPA. It's, you know, nothing wrong with starting and just listening your first few meetings and getting your um, getting your experience that way. So you shouldn't feel intimidated in that regard. Um, is there anybody who has a, any, any interest? I could, Robin, I, as long as it's on Zoom because in the winter time I'll be um, uh, out of the area and I, I would I wouldn't want to commit if if I require me being in person when I'm away. Mm -hmm. I thought at one point Hetty said she might be interested too, but I don't. She's not here right now. Oh, okay, that's true. I can um, I can send her an email. Okay, well, whichever of us it works out is I, I I we you know somebody has to do it. So right. Well, actually, <laughs> it can be vacant too. So <laughs> well, <laughs> I, 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 think, I think we need to exercise their prerogative. Um, so check like Patty if she's already said she wanted to do it, but otherwise I could consider it. Okay, great. And do you know, you don't have a sense made of what in-person versus Zoom is going to be like in the fall? Excuse no, me? Yeah, so yeah, I think... Question for Nate. Oh. Well, moving forward, I mean, I think Zoom's allowed to, um, to continue through um, things like June of 2025. So I think okay. it's, I think it might be at the discretion of the board or committee, um, okay. you know, in it. So I, you know, I, I do know that like a hybrid style where you're in town hall, but it's also Zoom is not an option. So it's kind of like either going back to all in person or staying re all remote. And I, you know, okay. I think that's something we could discuss. I mean, I, I'll, I throw my two cents in for remote meetings for a number of reasons, but um, yeah, in. Uh, uh, the design review board has been meeting remotely, like I said, and they, okay. you know, and they would typically used to meet if they had a set schedule, it was like the third Tuesday of the month at like three o'clock in the afternoon or something. I mean, that they try to have a, you know, something like that. Okay. And then, sure, that's doable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, as far as the CPA commission um, or committee, technically, um, do we want to vote on that now? I make a motion that we accept Robin's <laughs> uh, 
offer <laughs> offer to to represent us on the CPA commission. Okay, uh, I second that. Okay. Okay, so then we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Pat Oss. Yes. Uh, Michaela. Yes. Okay, Madeline. Yes. And Antonia. Yes. And I will also vote yes. So the vote is five zero in favor of uh, confirming Robin Fordham as the Historical Commission um, representative to the Community Preservation Act for this year. Okay. Um, and we will hold off on design review board for right now. And uh, I will email Hetty and, and find out where she stands on that. Yeah, you can you can let let us know, Robin. Thank yes. you. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for uh, your offer, Pat. Um, agenda item number four: documentation of 140 Southeast Street. Did you want to talk to that, Nate? Yeah, I think you know the and I think it was the end of March. The an owner of three properties on Southeast Street, at, you know, filed demolition applications, and there was one structure, 140, which um, appeared to be older, but was found not to be significant. And we did ask uh, that they invite us to document it more before it's demolished. And I think they are trying to move forward with that project a bit. So, you know, I just think we could get out there and try to take pictures. Uh, if we're going to do measurements or something. The contractor seemed willing to even do it himself and maybe assist with something. And I haven't reached, I, you know, I had emailed a while, a few weeks ago, and I had said, well, we'd still like to document it. And they seem amenable. So. Okay. Um, Madeline, you probably have the most experience in this regard. Do you have any interest in doing a site visit with me and Nate? I'm assuming Nate, you would come. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I could come by. Okay. Um, it would just be an interesting, interesting and perhaps valuable experience. Yeah, let's set it up. Okay. All right. And so I, I can just, I'll send a, an email tomorrow and we can just try to get a time maybe next week. Later this okay. week, next week, does that does that work? Yeah, I'm actually wide open, so that's fine with me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah, because I know that they, you know, you never know how fast they're really going to act, but <laughs> right. they talked about moving forward. Okay. Um, okay. Um, agenda item number five. We're going to have a discussion of commission goals. Nate, I hopefully sent you. Uh, a list just moments ago. This is what I've come up with so far. Um, Madeline, Madeline and I met and um, went over a few things. Um, my idea for having one year and five year goals was to keep the commission um, uh, sort of on, to keep in mind what our primary focus is. Um, as we move from meeting to meeting, um, because oftentimes we would discuss things and then I'm as guilty as anyone to come to the next meeting without having made progress moving forward. So um, I was trying to keep it simple and um, the three ideas I had for uh, our one-year goals were to have our barn program launch. So that is also the barn and outbuilding um, program. And um, for our new members, um, Last year, we made a proposal to the Community Preservation Act Committee for funding to um, fund assessments of farms and outbuilding structures in Amherst. Um, the idea being that these um, structures are at high risk for demolition because they've outgrown their usefulness if they're a barn or a carriage house or even um, a detached garage. There's often, um, um, they're not being necessarily being used for their original purpose. They might be a good structural condition, but owners don't really have a sense of how they could modify them or, or make good use of them. And so we wanted to provide um, property owners in Amherst the opportunity to have a match, if I'm remembering how I developed our program, <laughs> um, a match of funding so that um, they could have uh, a professional come and assess the structure. And that would include uh, historical documentation and um, uh, 
uh, structural documentation and also just kind of a general sense of what might be possible for rehabilitation or reuse of the resource. And uh, that program was approved by the CPA committee. And on July 1st, I think it's only 10 days ago, um, those funds became available. So we wanted to, the, the Historical Commission has been talking in particular about barns for several years now. And we wanted to um, try to have an event that would both promote this program and also just promote the um, barns in our area. So um, looking toward October, um, Madeline and I talked a little bit, we thought a three barn tour would be perfectly sufficient to maybe having an agricultural barn, a carriage barn, and maybe something like a, a detached garage um, as part of, we haven't identified those, but the, we landed on the number of three as being kind of a reasonable amount in a two hour time frame to go from one location to another. Um, I did connect with uh, John Porter, who I worked with last fall. I did a barn survey up in um, Lebanon, New Hampshire. He's a UNH professor emeritus who does talks about uh, barns in New Hampshire all the time and has a wealth of knowledge. And he does travel as long as the weather is good and he's reimbursed for his expenses. So he would be happy to join us, which I think would be great. Um, and then we would like to maybe focus on getting a mailing out to, um, so if I'm not, Nate, I'm not sure when the outbuilding survey started, um, but we have an, a survey that was conducted of outbuildings uh, around the town. And so we have addresses for um, property owners who have um, outbuildings that we've worked on to define some of the history around and would love to get a specific mailing to them to say, um, you know, consider having your barn or outbuilding assessed. And then um, maybe a town social media push to promote the program as well. Um, <clears throat> Jane Walks is um, a program that I learned about from Madeline, um, which I guess takes place in May of every year. Um, I'm going to screw up Jane's last name again. I was going to say Jane Adams, but it's not Jane Adams. Jane, Jane Jacobs. Jacobs. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, and these are just small neighborhood walks that um, um, can be organized by anyone. And um, they seem like a really great town event um, if the uh, Historical Commission wanted to work on them within this next year to um, have uh, one or two um, to see how, how having some walking architectural tours would, would go. And then finally, um, a focus on our modernist housing, um, starting to develop support for a survey of modernist buildings within Amherst, which has um, such a strong history uh, before the modernist period. Um, but we do have um, a good number of these resources around town. And we'd like to develop a list of those properties and maybe begin preliminary research on them. And then five-year goals, Nate, you can help me a little bit on this one because I can't quite remember what the status is with the East Village Historic District. I think we're in the middle of an update of that resource. Yeah, I think we still have to contract with PVPC to um, update the inventory forms and document. You know, the idea is we have a East Village National Register District from, gosh, I forget when it was actually, um, done um, and then the idea was to ex, you know to expand it we had pioneer valley planning commission look at possible expansion areas uh, and then at the same time the local historic district commission is looking at east amherst for a local historic district and so oh, okay. they're, they're looking at kind of doing a similar thing updating inventory forms on 40 to 50 properties and then defining a boundary which may or may not be coterminous with the national register district so there's some synergy there and some of it is just to East Amherst is the oldest um, village center in, in town. And it has, still has a historic common and a number of buildings from the late 1700s that are still, you know, still in pretty good condition. And so uh, some of it was just, you know, documenting that and then celebrating that, making it a little bit more aware. Uh, you know, the town is planning some projects there with affordable housing. And it's, you know, as one of the older village centers, there's really not a lot of uh, protections for the homes so I think that was some of it. Okay. Okay. So that's on the uh, the five year goal, and the, the idea with the five year goals is that they move from the five year goals to the one year goal. 
sort of as things kind of pick up speed. Um, the other, uh, a second area that I was thinking about was just um, identifying our non-traditional uh, historic resources. Um, I went to the Bridges exhibit at the Amherst College Library and um, took a look at the National Register District and that um, part of town and was thinking about um, how we can continue to focus on um, unearthing and promoting uh, aspects of uh, Amherst history that are not a traditional kind of white narrative. Um, and then just a general inventory update um, in terms of looking at our um, macros inventory and um, for uh, our new members and also maybe our existing members, um, MACRIS is the, the inventory system for uh, cultural resources um, and existing records within the MACRIS system that were, um, that were completed before. I can't quite remember what the cut update is. Is it like 94 or is it earlier than that Nate? remember? Like there's a point where um, MHC really changed the standards for what an inventory form looks like. So we may have a number of inventory forms that were completed in the 70s and the 80s that need um, uh, much more significant research and expansion of their historic narratives and their architectural descriptions. So that's you know kind of a big uh, ongoing project, but I threw that on there. So that's the beginning of our one year and five year goals. And people are free to, if anybody want to add, wants to add to the discussion or think uh, suggest things that should be added to either list, I'd be happy to hear commentary on that. It seems to me, Robin, that the Jane walks are are interesting, um, but that we would we would partner with the local historic districts because they're very familiar with the properties within the district and would have historical information that, that would be pertinent to leading a walk. Uh, that's a good point, both the lo local historic district and certainly the historical society. I know in just in my neighborhood here, which isn't in a local historic district, um, looking at map, maps from um, the Sanborn fire maps about um, all the factories that used to exist Along um, along the train tracks and the relationship of certain buildings that were um, uh, that were worker housing and that sort of thing. Like you don't even need it's it's what's kind of cool about the Jane Walks is you can just pick like a you know three block area as the as an amateur and just right. dig in and see what you can find. Maddie, Madeline, maybe you want to talk to that a little bit more? Yeah, it just sort of. Uh, you know, in honor of Jane Jacobs to just encourage anyone to dig into the history of an area and then what, uh, and then just give a, give an, a pretty informal walking tour to just show that history um, on foot. And I think what we would do is really sort of set up the structure for it and then kind of encourage anyone to to lead their own Jane Jane walk, maybe some of us would be interested in doing that. And you sort of hold it on one weekend uh, in May is when they all just sort of spring up and and members of the public can can tap in and and you know meet at the site um, and and see the walk when it happens. And then it's over. Yeah, it's yeah. Just, and then it's it, just it, a one year, yeah, once yeah, a year it, thing. <laughs> I mean, what what I think one of the reasons why it appeals to me is because it can include places that are you know, not as obviously uh, as obvious as a historic district, but of course those places can be too. But yes, you're right. Those you're right, Pat. Um, partnering with the local historic districts would be an obvious way to to get some really great walks going too. So hopefully that's something that we can move forward within the next year. And I was going to just say quickly for new members, and I guess as a reminder, you know, PVPC is still working on updating the preservation plan. And so I think we could invite them to a meeting uh, soon. And I'll, I could send this to uh, Robin. I can send this to uh, Shannon to copy you just so that we could have a discussion too. If she, you know, um, it's been a little uh, delayed in terms of their progress, but they have done outreach survey. We did a community survey. They've been doing um, 
we're going to do some stakeholder meetings, but they research the current preservation plan and bylaws. And the idea is we're hoping uh, as part of the preservation plan update, they would focus on kind of action items. And so this, you know, would marry well with what uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission is doing. And so it gets a little bit more specific. So what we, the preservation plan is, um, gosh, it's like 20 years old already almost, but, you know, it has some, some concrete steps, but some of it was, you know, at short, medium and long-term goals. And some of them were pretty specific and others are more just general. And so I think this can be a supplement or can really, you know, add to what um, PVPC has been doing. So we're really hoping we can get some actionable items for the, you know, one to three year goals. That way we're not, you know, as Robin mentioned, we can get caught up with, say in the CPA process, sometimes reviewing proposals might take, you know, two meetings, you know, time out of two or three meetings and then there's big demolition projects. And so it's nice to have a structure that can guide the commission, uh, especially year to year. And I do like the, the modernist housing. I feel like there's, you know, maybe only a few that have been actually inventoried, but there's probably a lot more that could be. Yeah, and actually, um, Nate, what is it? So my understanding is that um, if you have a, it's not called a subcommittee, what is it called, like a task force? Like a, a um, Madeline and Hetty and I would like to work together on that. And this would be a good meeting to um, maybe establish that as a structure. I think that we did that for, we called it a task force when we were doing also uh, the demolition delay by a law rewrite. Um, so we would be the three members who would be working on that. We were gonna develop, start with just developing a list of, of addresses and maybe bring that to either the next meeting or in two months and go from there. Yeah, I guess a little tricky between, you know, like an ad hoc group and a subcommittee. So as long as we don't necessarily vote on it and you're really just kind of doing information gathering, mm -hmm. I think we're okay. Um, at some okay. point, we start getting more into, um, you know, substantive discussion about whether or not something's significant or should be preserved. But if it's really just kind of pulling up addresses and doing information gathering, that's fine. Okay, great. Okay, any other, any other comments on one and five year goals? Yeah, I think the modernist housing uh, survey is, it's just important to realize that so much of Amherst was surveyed in the 1980s and everything had to be 50 years old then. So that means there's so many properties that were built after 1935 that we just don't know about. So or, you know, they're not on that, Chris, represented um, the, through the MHC website. Um, so I think it would be really interesting to, to look at all those. Agreed. Any other comments on that agenda item? Um, I think, oh, well, I guess this isn't on that agenda item, but this all looks really interesting. And I think one thing, even though it's in the five-year goals, the identifying non-traditional historic resources, I would be interested in um, doing research for that. I know that um, like the Amherst Library, Frost Library has a lot, like a huge archive, I think, and has been doing a lot of work of uncovering um, different um, narratives of history um, of the town. So I'd, I could, reach out to them and see what um, they've been working on. Oh, that would be great. That would be great. And yeah, anybody who wants to just raise their hand and join any of these initiatives, feel free. Thank you, Cambodia. That's, that's exciting. <laughs> any other comments? Okay. So in that case, I would say that we will go on to agenda item six, discussion of CPI funding for historic preservation soft costs. Do you want to speak to that, Nate? Uh, yeah, I, I, actually, I will just say one other, um, uh, somewhat related, but you know, uh, tangential is that the uh, a few years ago there was a court case, a state ruled that there's um, you have to follow some strict um, test to award CPA funding to religious institutions, and so oftentimes, you know, churches are also very historic in a community, especially in Massachusetts, but the town has awarded CPA funding to you know, a number of churches and we're 
we just we, the town voted some um, for South Church, and we have some others that are we've been working with. And so it's not necessarily related to this, but I think uh, you know moving forward, Robin, as the CPA rep, I was just going to say that if a church is interested in using CPA funding, we should just have them contact the town right away. And I think um, the town's attorneys at KP Law said we should just kind of vet it right right up front, even if they're before they even submit a CPA application, we can try to frame it so that we can know that it's eligible. And so okay. we've been and doing my it. Okay. Yeah. But my understanding is that the eligibility is related to um, public access and public view, right? That it can't promote, it can't promote the mission of the church. Like it can't promote the religious mission right. and it has to be accessible to public. Yeah, it's a little more nuanced, unfortunately, but, um, you know, we kind of do that to make sure it, it is, but I think we should just, I think we have to be, you know, just do it. I guess it's a, we've been doing it along the process, but I think we should just jump on that. Um, right, extra, extra scrutiny, send them straight to you, <laughs> right? <laughs> but for the soft costs, I mean, it's the same thing though. So we've been working with one or two churches to help them apply for CPA funding. And so to me, it's related in that, you know, a lot of organizations don't have the funding to even, do an assessment of their building or know where to start and so oftentimes they might need to hire an engineer or an architect or a historian to look into the structure and then come up with a proposal uh, but the cpa committee often wants the proposal already in hand right they want the cost estimates they want the scope of work and a lot of organizations and applicants just don't have that ability to put one together to put that that information together and so we've been somewhat hamstrung by the by that lack of funding, right? To start kind of do those these pre-development assessments. And so some of it would be working with the CPA committee to apply for funding to get that either through the historic preservation aspect of CPA or for, from the administrative funds. But I think a lot of people don't understand historic preservation and that I think studying something, learning about it and even making that public is part of preservation. And so, I think sometimes people think like just bricks and mortar is preservation, right? You you fix the the you know you fix something, you fix the chimneys, that's preservation. You fix the roof, and they don't necessarily understand that studying something, researching it, documenting it is also can also be preservation in terms of education and outreach. And so, you know, we've in the past we had some money um, from CPA for this, and it ha we haven't had it in a little bit. And Robin and I have talked about trying to regain some of that funding because. For instance, uh, someone came to the commission earlier this year to demolish a house in North Amherst. It was found to be significant and there's a delay issued and staff's been working with the owner to determine what could happen with the house. And they had asked like, oh, well, is there any more, is there funding for me to study it a little bit more? Like, I'm like, no. Is there funding if we wanted to do something? I'm like, sorry, no. Right. And it would be great if we had some, some, some small amount of money that we could match the owner so that then they could do a little bit more work. Uh, the owner is, has been doing things on his own, but it's just, you know, it's, it's hard when we find something significant or we think it has value, but then we don't have the ability to, to research it or document it. Right, right, and that can be overwhelming for the owner. Nate, um, do you and I, I mean, I know that I think I, and I'm sure you're swamped with everything, <laughs> but I think I sent you again. The language from the CPA committee, which, you know, there is this language in there that basically says, you know, you can't fund it. I mean, my my translation of of the language of the this is the guidance from the Department of Revenue is that unless it's necessary for the town to have that assessment in order to basically steward that historic resource. It's, you know, it's pretty clear that there's this kind of wiggle room in there. And I don't know if you and I want to make a presentation to the CPA committee. I don't know if the town council wants to be there so that we could, if we could settle it once and for all, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, I, I, Robert, it might be take, you know, some research by the commission and then, you know, right, the two of us, or it could be three of us making a pres presentation to the CPA committee. So I, I just, yeah, I, I don't, we don't necessarily need to involve town council um, at this point, unless we want it to become some kind of policy, but I think, I think we should start the conversation. Uh, I'm looking at my, yeah, it's already mid July, but maybe the next month or two, right. We'd meet with the CPA committee. Yep. 
Yeah, that would be great. It would be good, good to start off the, the, it would be good to start off the CPA um, um, annual process with the discussion of that and then to, with the intent of making it. I mean, I would like to see it be a policy because right. it's inspiring to kind of, you know, to have to reinvent the wheel every year and argue, argue for it, so. Um, but that's essentially uh, the intention of the Historic Commission is to support the, the funding of soft costs for applicants for CPA funds, right? It's right. general gist of things. <laughs> Anybody have any questions around that? Or if you wanna, you know, do some research and, and you know, if you, if you see an article that, you know, sometimes there's great articles just floating around out there that talk about, you know, the importance of documentation or research for historic preservation, you can just send Robin or myself a link. It's okay to send information between commission members. The, um, you know, the previous chair of the CPA committee, this is a number of years ago, used to say that, you know, with affordable housing, for instance, you just roll in soft costs into the total development costs. You just kind of bury it in the cost of construction. And so it's not called out as a line item, but with historic preservation, oftentimes it is because we like to see you know, the scope of work or this kind of preservation plan or something ahead of time. And so becomes this discrete phase that then is difficult to fund as part of this total project, right? And uh, yeah. we ran into this last year, someone came to the CPA committee and said, oh, I think I need $600,000 to fix the roof siding and whatever. And then the committee's like, well, can you really work with someone to refine that number? And it's like, well, that's where we would no. want to find it. <laughs> right. Right. Like, right. Exactly. Obviously, yeah, right. they don't have they don't have the funding <laughs> right. to do right. that kind of work on right. their own. Right. Yeah. It's kind of like the, the cart before the horse. <laughs> I know. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, moving on. Next agenda item is update and programming for our historic barns outbuildings assessment pilot program. Is that an update from you, Nate? <laughs> now that we are in the funding portion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we're in it. I just, I haven't, um, yeah, I think the idea of reaching out to the property owners that were identified by the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission is probably the next first, next step, right? Um, yep. I think that's the step. And I have to, to um, revisit my notes uh, because I had spoken with um, an assessment specialist who's, I think he's based in Pennsylvania, but I want to develop a roster of at least, you know, three or four um, entities who could provide services because it's um, it's definitely a, a challenging uh, thing to track down and if we could provide you know a list of three or four people that people could call um, for our our existing members and our new members um, down the street from me there is uh, um, some people I know who own a rental property um, that abuts their primary residence, which has an attached barn at the back that they're looking to um, um, adapt into housing. And it has, um, I think they're called king boards. Um, I don't remember a lot about the history of it, but they're like a perfect example of, um, I need to uh, get back in touch with them, but a, a great um, project where there's a property owner who wants to adapt the existing structure wants to treat it um, with historical sensitivity and could use um, funds to help um, drive their project, so. Do we have any other update from the town, Nate, just on, I mean, if the funds are available at this point, right? Oh, did we lose you? There we go. <laughs> No, I had someone. I had someone else talking to me. Oh. <laughs> Coming up to you on the on the historic comment to talk to you. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, we don't have any. There's there's nothing more from the town in terms of that program. Just that the funds are available at this point, right? Because fiscal right. years. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They were just um, rolled over, you know, last week. So I think we can get yeah. moved. Okay, great. Uh, old business um, policy for historic preservation restrictions. Yeah, we had we had talked about this. So with CPA funding, oftentimes we we had required a permanent preservation restriction, which 
It needs to be approved and reviewed by the Massachusetts Historical Commission. It adds a lot of time and actually costs as well, and it may not be necessary. And so the commission has met, talked about it for a number of months on and off about allowing, you know, having, um, using CPA funding, but having a local restriction or having, you know, a term limited restriction, whether that's 30 years or 50 or 99, which may or may not be in perpetuity for some people. But, you know, I've asked uh, the attorney or the town's attorneys to develop a, a draft restriction uh, just to see what it would look like. Um, I think that would make the projects a lot more amenable to some. So oftentimes when we apply, if, some, if an outside agency is looking for funding, you know, it is public funding. So we do want to have some, in, some, some way to make that investment uh, have a public benefit, but, you know, a permit restriction or encumbrance on the property is usually a deterrent. And so it, it, it's surprising, but it does, well, it'll keep a lot of projects from coming forward or receiving this kind of funding. And yeah, and just for our, our new members and as a reminder to existing members, um, the preservation restriction, um, the idea is that um, when we fund something with Community Preservation Act funds, uh, we create something called a restriction, which keeps um, historically insensitive activities from happening to a building that we've just invested a lot of money in preserving its historic um, its historic integrity. So, I mean, an easy example would be um, if we were to fund uh, a roof repair for a historic church, which had existing uh, windows that were historic and they wanted to replace them with final replacement windows, that would be uh, in violation of the restriction. The restriction would be there so that um, whatever further activity that they wanted to do to the build, building would be guided by appropriate um, limitations that have to do with preserving the historic integrity of the building. But um, our restrictions in the past have been, I guess, in perpetuity, and um, that has caused uh, entities to decide that they don't wanna go for the funding because it's too restrictive. So we talked about a 30 year limit, um, particularly for smaller projects where, um, probably within those 30 years, somebody's going to come for community preservation funding again, and that will start the 30 year clock and, and hopefully it, it helps create a situation where people are interested in the funding and not dissuaded by kind of an overly restrictive um, uh, programmatic uh, dealing with the building, but that ultimately in the long term uh, will still serve to benefit the, the historic integrity of the resource. Yeah, um, I mean that you know the Jones Library. I just finally reported we have a restriction on the Jones Library, and so you know that that is through Mass Historic. It's a it took a long time to get <laughs> approved. Uh, so they actually they will be coming back to the commission probably in the next two months as you know, and there'll be a hearing, both a demolition hearing, so on to tear down part of the the back, but also um, to review the project following the restriction guidelines, and so. There's minor alterations and major alterations. And if you know if something's a major alteration, it needs review by the commission. So it's not, you know, the commission could allow, you know, a Robin said vinyl windows. It, they could allow it, but you'd have to justify it. And so um, once you know we get into that, I can provide um, information and guidance. But you know, mass historic, for instance, requires that the restriction be on the entire property. And so there's a number of properties that change boundaries over time or grow. And so for instance, the Jewish community of Amherst has CPA funding, and now they have three buildings on their property. And when we went to Mass Historic, they said, we went around the entire property. You have to do a lot more work to document all the buildings. And we said, well, the funding is only on one building. And at the time it was its own property and yada, yada, yada. So now, you know, it just became, it's still, we're still working through it. It's just, it's a really difficult thing. Mass Historic can just say no, and then we have to uh, comply. And so, uh, the CPA does say that you need a restriction when you acquire an interest in property. Most communities mean that's when you purchase a property, not when you fund projects. And so, you know, there's some kind of legal, uh, you know, kind of terminology there. So I think we're safe to not have permanent restrictions. Northampton, for instance, when they award CPA funding for many projects don't require a restriction at all. And so I agree with Robin that smaller projects, whatever that means in terms of dollar amount or or a proportion to assess value, you know, shouldn't necessarily have a permanent restriction. 
I think that could help with a lot more projects coming forward. And I can post a question to the lister uh, for other communities as to what their preservation restriction policy is, just to get an idea of how other communities handle it throughout the state. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any questions about policy for historic preservation restrictions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so national register nominations, right? Yeah, I, I, um, you know, I've been working with PVPC a little bit. Um, you know, we had submitted a few uh, before COVID, right as COVID was, was hitting and it's taken Mass Historic a long time to get caught up. And so, you know, they've preliminary, preliminarily approved two district expansions and nominations and it's just, it does require some extensive follow-up. So as, uh, as Madeline and Robin mentioned, Amherst has um, probably, I don't know if it's over 2000 properties inventoried, but you know, a thousand of those inventory forms were completed in the eighties, early nineties, and they're an old format and they don't have a lot of research done on the properties. And so Mass Historic has asked that we essentially just complete a whole new inventory form for every property in the district. And that's a, you know, a project this is the East, East Village District. East Village, even um, yeah. the Depot District. They we asked some questions about how or why that would be a different district than East. Which Amherst. one? I'm sorry, I missed oh, that. Looked at doing like a, an expansion to the Depot District. You know, it was like right near the Dickens okay, but the railroad tracks, and so okay. it has some questions about why that would be different than either the Dickinson or the East East Amherst, and so um, we've been working through that. But yeah, there is some extra CPA money the commission has, and I. We talked about this, I think, two months ago, and we're having PVPC, hoping that PVC, PVPC update the inventory forms. Um, it's just, a, it's a, it is a slow process, but I just, you know, I think it's something we don't want to forget about. Okay. Just to, and just so, to so it's the, what are the national register nominations? So it's not individual properties that are being. Right. It's, it's a district, it's the, yeah, districts. Okay, so it's the East Village. And the depot district. The or, depot. Yeah. Okay. And so there's just some back and forth between PVPC and MHC on that. Yeah, and I think we might have to give PVPC an extra some extra funding just so they can complete the inventory forms. Okay. And is that um, something that will go forward as a CPA proposal? There was. Or do, we already, do we still have? We still I think have it's funding. leftover funding from two years ago. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And do we have any um, any individual national register nominations that we're interested in putting forward? No. So you know we can uh, you can you can list individual properties, and you know a number of years ago we had looked at um, well one down on West Street and then one on um, uh, East, uh, East Pleasant. But I don't think there's any right now that have been discussed. Okay. Um, yeah, that would, I'm just thinking about um, whether there's anything within the, um, the Snell Street I can't remember what the name of that district is. The, you know, I hadn't really, I hadn't really even known about it to, um, until I went to the Bridges um, exhibit. But you know, really interesting to if, whether something within this traditional African American community was, you know, if, whether it was the, is it the Goodwin Church? Is that the, or you know, whether there's something there that that would warrant um, um, heading to the National Register. Level. Yeah, yeah, and I don't know. I mean, there's Baker Street over there, and yeah, I mean, it could just be a, a drive-by kind of survey, windshield survey, and see if there's anything. Um, it could be worth looking into. Okay. I was just pointing up a Google map. Yeah, the um, you know, when you do when you list an individual property, the individual property owners need to agree to it, and they, they you know, they're somewhat not they're not they're not necessarily involved, but you know, you may need to get into the interior of the property and the house to take pictures. And so it's right. more, than, you know, it's a little bit more involved than a, a district nomination. Okay. 
Um, and just for our new members, so National Register nominations are, um, they're like an honorary um, title. They're, they don't come with any funding, but they do elevate um, uh, a building's um, importance when it comes to, like, for example, if something comes before the CPA Committee for Funding, and it's either um, a what we would call a contributing resource in a, in a National Register Historic District. So you have an entire area that has a bunch of um, properties in it, or if it's an individual building listed on the National Register, um, it just gives the property more weight. And so one of the um, one of the responsibilities of a historical commission is to make sure that the um, inventory of the town is up to date. And that's, um, that's one of the things that we can do. So particularly, um, looking for these uh, non-traditional narratives and, and seeing if there's a balance in our inventory to elevate the different stories of Amherst would be something that I'm thinking about. Yeah, and just quickly, it is important. I mean, uh, you know, uh, for instance, South Church was awarded CPA funding and then the, the questions came up whether or not it was eligible being a religious institution. And, you know, I was able to pull from the district nomination and from the inventory form. So it was inventoried actually in the 70s. It was probably one of the earliest properties, but because the church was identified as a really important architectural feature on the South Amherst Common, you know, it, and it was documented 60 years ago, 70 years ago, however long ago, right, that um, there's always been something written about it, that it's architecturally, it's an important feature. And then it was, you know, this was all solidified in the nominations. Uh, it really helped it be eligible for CPA funding. And so yeah. a nonprofit organization or even a private individual, depending on what happens, it, it, you know, I think like Robin said that, elevating it to that status can really help it apply for grants or receive funding or you know certain recognition yeah. so yeah yeah and it's not just cpa funding it's other funding as well so definitely okay um any other questions about national register nominations questions or comments mm -hmm. okay um so barn tours we talked a little bit about work in progress <laughs> Uh, I will not be at the next meeting, but I will commit at this point to having an update uh, on that by the next meeting. Anybody have any questions or comments on bar tours? Okay. Uh, so then we would move to public comment. There is anyone in the public who would like to comment? on the proceedings of this meeting of the historical commission um i guess feel free to raise your hand there's still you know hilda's here she's one member i don't see anyone else okay is hilda interested in making a comment i don't see any hands being raised okay okay all right, so then we move to unanticipated items. And uh, the only one that I would uh, come up with for this meeting is that I just wanted to report that um, Petty Startup and I attended the Docomomo. Maybe Madeline can, can remind me what all the, that's documenting, conserving. You can do modern. it. What's the mo, what's the other mo? <laughs> Modernist. Momo. I don't, I'm not sure. <laughs> right. uh, Doka Momo is a uh, preservation a group that focuses on the documenting and conservation of modernist buildings all around. Uh, I, I think it's international. Is it internationally? Or is it just nationally? I don't know if it's the North American or. Um, I think it's just US. Okay, just the US. And. Um, uh, Hetty and I decided to head down and go to a couple of paper sessions on Friday, and uh, we went to a couple of tours on Friday and Saturday. Um, I attended the uh, paper session on reexamining re the model city and the model campus, and um, that was really interesting. There were three different presentations. One was specifically about Yale, which was not quite um, pertinent to the Amherst experience, but one was a general history of how universities expanded during the brutalist 
period. And that was a really interesting paper session, just um, understanding, I have a bunch of notes that I need to write up, um, understanding how government funding came in at this time when, so this was a, the, um, uh, the GI, or the, it wasn't the baby boomers, but it was the, I think the GI generation coming in, or maybe the baby boomers too, creating this really huge expansion and need for um, campuses all over the country to uh, expand to accommodate this huge influx of students. And that um, coincided with the modernist movement, which is why you get a lot of buildings uh, like we have in Massachusetts uh, in the Amherst campus and the Dartmouth campus, and I think the UMass Boston campus and um, so that was really interesting to understand um, the context for why those buildings came in and how they got funded at um, the time that they did. Um, then one of the other presenters um, was from the Dartmouth campus and they had um, developed a 45 minute campus tour. They're really trying to promote um, brutalism as an architectural style, which is not beloved by all. If anybody who lives in Amherst, they appreciate that some people love brutalism and some people don't. And I have come to love it over time. But I was surprised um, as I was <laughs> as I was sitting in the session, uh, realizing I didn't really even know who built our brutalist buildings. Uh, to learn that the, both the campus center, which was built by which was signed by Marcel Brewer, and then um, the Fine Arts Center, which was Kevin. Roche are really substantial architects in their field and that there was this, you know, big design and there's really a whole story behind the whole UMass campus and um, while they're, um, well, I don't quite know what, I, I know that we weigh in on some Amherst, UMass Amherst projects, I don't know that we have, we don't have demolition delay control over there right now, but we, we do connect with them, they come to us to talk about um, about projects. Um, one of the things that I learned when I was in uh, my first class at UMass Amherst in the history of uh, historic preservation was the adaptation of the UMass Fine Arts Center to create that lobby, which had been an open space, which had been um, designed by the original architect, Ken Roche, to uh, be a, sort of a viewscape onto the campus pond. And um, my understanding of the class at that time was that uh, the adaptation that was made to it was not really in line with the architect's vision. <laughs> and and uh, one of the tours that we got to go on was actually for um, the Kevin Roche um, uh, uh, architectural offices, which had um, uh, descended from those of uh, Eros Saarinen. So we actually, we went to the um, Yale, uh, the Yale ice rink, which uh, had been designed by Saren and, and then was adapted by Roche. And so you were able to see this um, example of, a, of an art uh, of architecture built by one architect and that was adapted to try to keep in line with the original idea so that the, the, um, that the vision was not disturbed. So those really interesting and informative. Um, and then Hetty also attended um, uh, a session called Live, Laugh, Preserve, uh, Stories and Strategies for Saving Modern Homes. Um, and that was interesting. It was, um, she explained it to me. We were in separate sessions. Um, it just showcased preservation efforts for single family modernist, modernist dwellings in a bunch of different locations facing uh, various challenges. Um, one in particular was like in the Hamptons where a lot of smaller uh, modernist buildings are facing knockdown because people want to build larger, more expansive uh, structures. Um, so that was a really interesting and valuable experience. And I hope that it helps us kind of weigh in a little bit when we have more, as we approach kind of documenting our modernist resources and thinking about them in the context of Amherst history. And with that, our next meeting date, I believe, August 10th, is that right? Is that what we decided? <laughs> it was the 8th or the 10th. I'm, 
I, I, I think I, I think we decided the tenth, and that Madeline would would take the helm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I, you know, either day, either of the days, we will have a demolition application. Um, it's for removing part of an older barn in South Amherst. They're actually not. It meets our definition of demolition, where you take down twenty five percent of a, of a facade. Um, it's a it's a it's an attached uh, shed onto an older barn, and so they're really not necessarily demolishing the older barn, but they are going to, you know, then cover one whole facade uh, with a new addition. And so, you know, it, it, I don't think it's too complicated. They're not, you know, they're actually going to pour a separate foundation and not disturb the older barn, which is a, a probably could be from the late um, 19th century. But anyways, that'll be on the August agenda. And then anything else, you know, I'm not um, the Jones Library project, you know, the Jones Library has been working on an expansion project for a while, and they are getting ready to submit a demolition application, as well as a review of the um, restriction. And so, Robin, with you, with you not being here in August, and then I'm on vacation the week before the 10th, you know, I, I would probably want that meeting to be uh, in September. And that okay. way, you know, we can try to make sure we get everyone here. Okay. Now that could be, you know, that I think for the for new members, you know, the library edition, uh, you know, there's definitely some proponents and then opponents of it. And so at that meeting, it would be two separate public hearings that would happen at one meeting at a concurrent meeting, but one would be reviewing the demolition request and then also reviewing the projects in terms of the preservation restriction. I think it makes sense to have them together because they, you know, it's kind of one and the same. Uh, but, you know, as a public hearing, we, we would allow public comment and it could be a long meeting. And so, you know, I, I might suggest that in September, that could be, that'll likely be one agenda topic. And maybe we have either a second meeting that month because it could be that we spend two hours just talking about the library. Um, maybe okay. it's its own meeting. Yeah. Okay. So can I just clarify the meeting is on the 10th? Uh, yeah, as long as that's fine with Madeline to chair, because I won't be there. Yes, that's fine. Okay, so um, yeah, it would be the tenth. I leave the ninth, the ninth, which is why uh, it would be good for me to bow out for comments. But um, if that works with everybody, I mean, I've got everybody but me available on the tenth. Thank you. Um, yeah, for for September, I. We'll have limited availability because I'm um, I'm expecting uh, so <laughs> I'll have a, a newborn then. Um, Perfect. I don't know if I can make hours long meetings, but we'll okay. see. I'll be back in September. <laughs> yeah. No. I, I just yeah. I'm anticipating that the library discussion will be could be lengthy. Okay. Yeah. I'll try. Okay. So, so we can um, shift, you know, I was going to say we can always shift meeting times, you know, we can pull members, but we have our August meeting set, but, you know, in September, if we need to, you know, we can, if we need to be flexible, I don't know, I mean, I'm just saying, you know, especially with a Zoom meeting, we could, if we need to shift the start time or something, if it works for members, that's fine. Okay. And then, um, I guess going back to unanticipated items, um, we are still one member down. Uh, and I, Nate, I sent you an email, and this is just to throw out to the commission. Um, I would like to uh, invite uh, Annika Lopes, who's been behind the Civil War tablets and the Bridges Project, um, to either join our committee or to recommend someone to join our commission. Um, I was also curious about the possibility of aligning a member of the local historic district commission to be an alternate member. So if we get into a bind where we have a demolition hearing and we're having trouble making quorum, um, whether that could be explored as a possibility. And then I think we've never reached out to, or if we have, I don't know, to the historical society um, to have somebody, somebody from their organization or someone that they could recommend um, to join the commission. Those will all be great. Um, assets. So looking for non-traditional voices, looking for 
strong, rich history voices looking for somebody from the Historic District Commission to be an overlay between the two would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure about that in terms of an alternate, but I do think we could ask, we, you know, it's it's okay to ask people to recruit members. Um, you know, they have to submit a, you know, a citizen activity form. So I don't yeah. think counselors could serve on this commission. Uh, you know, they might be a, a liaison, but they might- Wait, who, could, who could not? I don't think counselors can also then serve on other boards and committees. Oh, okay. okay. But, but I think we could ask, you know, that they at least, they can, you know, they could refer someone or they might have an idea. Oh, it's Annika's the counselor, right? Is that right, correct? Right. Or Anika, I'm probably pronouncing it right. Um, okay, okay, yeah, but I would love to have her recommendation. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. Robin, you know, I could reach out to her or if you want to reach out to her, I think that's a, a great idea. Okay, great. Um, yep. And if anybody has any suggestions for anyone they know that they think would make a good addition, feel free to send me an email. And then um, for Antonio and Michaela, just uh, uh, maybe I said this in an email to everybody, but um, public meeting, uh, open meeting law requires no deliberation between members uh, with, a, uh, with a quorum, which means that whenever some, an email is sent out to all of us, if you reply all with a comment on something, it can potentially be a violation of open meeting. So we always ask that if you're ever replying to an email from Nate or me with all the members, just reply to the one person. Reply to the one person that you're, whether it's Nate who's sending it or me who's sending it, or if you want to have a conversation with another um, commission member, that's perfectly fine, but you can't do it with a group of four or more. So never reply all. Yeah, and I would say oftentimes it's unintentional, and, um, That's exactly right. Yes, right. <laughs> uh, Got it. Oh, yep. Yeah. Got it. Thank you for that. Oh, okay. Great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's 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 something that happens. It happens with every board and committee. Someone might send an article, which is fine. Hey, here's a great article, and then someone writes back and says, "Oh, this is really interesting. I really like this part, and maybe we could look into it." And then another committee member writes all and says, "Yeah, that's great. I'm I've been thinking about doing this too." And then all of a sudden, you have four people having what really should be a conversation in an open meeting happening over email. And as long as you have that conversation in an open meeting, it doesn't you know, mean that it's okay to have it over email, but sometimes yeah. you just, you know, it's just, it happens so quickly online. Uh, yeah, that's basically it. So just no reply all, <laughs> the basic shorthand. Okay, so our next meeting date is August 10th at 6.30. Madeline will be chairing the meeting. And um, that is our last agenda item. So if there is no objection from anyone here or the public, uh, I will call the close of this meeting of the Historical Commission at 7.46 PM. And my understanding is we don't need a vote to close, right, Nate? Nope. Okay. All right. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Good night, everyone. everyone. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.